Thank you. I'm just going to move some things around here so I can see the Zoom meeting from where I'm standing. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, this is the GNU C Library Both. It's a BOF intended for you, the community, to ask questions. Is there anything that we want to work on? Anything that we'd like to look at over the next coming six months? Do you want to implement something? I've got a couple of slides just to cover in the event that no one has anything you want to talk about. I've always got lots of things to talk about. <laughs> so community items. What would you like to discuss about glibc other than the Pthread Convar signal stealing bug is still not fixed, and I licked that cookie, and I have to fix it myself. Anything? Nick. Yeah, and we'll pass the microphone to you. Yep. Yeah, got it. Oh, right. Um, so, do you keep an eye on other? Oh. Um, how, how do you compare to muscle and new lid and things like that in terms of performance and size? Um, so the, the, there's two parts to this question. There's, um, well, I'd like to say there's probably two parts to this question. There is a coordination part, which is that the, there are multiple C libraries, obviously, in the broader ecosystem. Uh, we got Muscle, Diet Libc, UC Libc, the FreeBSD Libcs, glibc, and those things. And what I think was really useful is we now have a libc coward mailing list on OpenWall that was set up by Florian Weimer. And the, that mailing list's intent is to talk about things that impact all of the libcs. So for example, like there is a misunderstanding about how open memstream is supposed to behave in the face of errors. For, and the standard is kind of loosey-goosey about it. So if there's someone who's interested in that, it requires kind of pushing consensus with all the libraries and coordinating over having all of them return something sensible for open memstream. And I think there were similar issues with sterile copy, sterile cat, where like the various, the standard's kind of a little bit ambiguous, and the various libraries pick a specific implementation choice. So there's the coordination aspect. So I think for coordination, we have libc cord. If there's something we need to talk about with muscle, we can talk about there. Then there's the other thing, which is comparison with the other libraries in terms of, are we implementing the same APIs? Do we have to follow up and implement new ones? Um, there, we don't often track very many things. I will say that I am on the um, a muscle mailing list, and s you know several of the glibc developers are on that list, and several of the muscle developers are on the glibc list, and so we often just talk about issues when we see them come up on the various lists. Like when muscle has an issue with something that we have an implementation for already, we will sometimes comment on their list and say, hey, by the way, in glibc we did it this way because algorithmically maybe there's like no other way to implement this solution on Linux. Right, because the, the kernel gives you finite primitives that you can use, and then one way to implement them is like this. Um, but we haven't done a, like a deep dive to say, um, here's where the various C libraries differ in terms of performance. Others have, though. So there are two things that we could look at. One is Paul Zimmerman from INRIA publishes a somewhat you know, quarterly report on how the math libraries are doing. If you've seen Paul Zimmerman's report, it's really good. He deep dives into float, double, long double, and the oops results for the various libraries. And it's kind of like this, like, you know, Indy 500 car race, of like, nah. it's like glibc is in the lead. And like, we've got oops, like for some functions, and then muscle pulls ahead. And then, you know, we have, Wilco and Zabosch and Arm working to improve some of the math library functions and glibc pulls ahead. And so, but like Paul Zimmerman does a great comparison of muscles libc, libm, glibc's libm, uh, the Intel uh, libm, the AMD libm, and because there's a whole bunch of other compilers and, and, and math libraries. Um, so those show us places where 
we could be doing work in those math libraries. Um, and I do know that Rich Felker on Muscle's own website publishes kind of a list of performance numbers, but I don't know if, if Rich keeps those updated or not. But it, it, we, we have different sets of users, I think, and those different sets of users, both between BSD and glibc and Muscle, have different requirements. And so because of those requirements, the implementations are different. And so sometimes it's like comparing apples and oranges, whether or not the performance matters because the workloads and the use cases are going to be different. So at the end of the day, when it comes to performance, what I care about as a steward is if you submit a performance patch, we want to talk about micro benchmarking. And if that performance patch affects something that has a fast path, we should be writing a micro benchmark for it to try to understand and objectively be able to talk about the performance. Now, the micro benchmark, you might say, oh, it's not indicative of real world performance. Doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that we have something that is the root of a conversation about performance, right? Like, um, so like, we're gonna have an unwinder boff later on today. We have no C++ unwind micro benchmarks. And I've been talking to Jonathan Wakely about this as well, which is like, for the use cases and the workloads that you care about, your community should be making the decisions about which things are important and which things are not important. And so in this case, I really do think um, that Florian's new unwinder function, we should be benchmarking it so that we don't regress performance because we added it specifically to improve C++ unwind performance. And so we need to have a, probably a micro benchmark there that tests the glibc side of the unwind so that we don't lose that performance. That was a really long answer, but it was a really good question. Sorry, Joseph. I don't know if it's on. Is it red or green? There's the question, is anyone interested in integrating Paul Zimmerman's core back functions that to a large extent are, are more accurate and faster than the glibc ones, but it would require someone to integrate them in the glibc source tree and build system and ensure they're properly ported to the systems glibc supports and so on. So is anyone Doing that. So I'm going to repeat your question, Joseph, because that mic is still not on. The question from Joseph was, uh, Paul Zimmerman maintains a number of core math library routines that are modern implementations. They are higher performance and lower OOPS than the current GLIBC implementations. Um, the question would be, is anyone in the community anyone interested in interested doing in the integration doing work? work? Oh, oh, Michael. Michael. You're unmuted. Yeah, we are getting some feedback through Michael. Oh, perfect. I think you're muted. You're muted. Good. Um, the, so the question is: Is anyone interested in doing the integration work of Paul's routines into glibc to improve the generic core libm routines? Um, it's not on my agenda. But I, like it's, it would be a good project. It is uh, a bit of taking Paul's routines, doing a bit of integration work, doing a bit of build system work. So it, it's, it's not a bad starter project. I would expect that Paul might be interested in it since he knows it best. He, he may be, but Paul may be also busy doing the, the implementation work. So we, we can speak with Paul, I guess. Um, I, I, I believe that we had conversations with Paul um, about, you know, are all the prerequisites in place for us to just be able to integrate those? And I think the prerequisites are, which are mostly like, it, is the license okay? Do the other, does everything else work? Or could, you know, could, can they be used? Can they be compiled by GCC and things like that? So I think the, the prerequisites are certainly there, which means that this could become a project for someone that wants to attempt, even if you took one function and integrated one function. Um, I guess a question for Joseph, 
Joseph, could we do the integration piecemeal, you think? Could we break up the integration? Yes, I think it could be done piecemeal. As I'm pretty sure he suggested he's providing the core functions, it's up to the various libcs to do the integration work. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's great. And then we would pull ahead in the Indy 500 car race of who's got the lowest oops. Um, it's a lot of work to do those math libraries, particularly uh, correctly rounded. Um, the last time we had a discussion about how many person years it would take to do a CR libm, I think our estimate was 300 years of PhD research. So, and this was, we, because we, we were discussing this with some academics in the field, um, and uh, in particular, this was discussing like um, uh, polynomial solutions to the, these functions, so using a solia as a solver and outputting from the description of the function uh, C code that then the solver would prove is correct because that's how you get correctly rounded libm functions. But the estimate for the number of APIs and the bivariate APIs and the proofs for those to get CR, it was 300 years. So in 20, 23, 22, like hopefully this conference is still going on and we'll be reading here again and going, look, we solved it, correctly rounded math library routines. <laughs> I think the trouble with that 300 year estimate is, well, it's true that maybe 20, 25 years ago, it was a whole PhD for someone to do the corrected rounded exp for double, but the state of the art has moved on since then. So it's no longer expected to take a whole PhD per function. Yeah, and I guess maybe this estimate was like five years ago, probably, so. <laughs> so, I, I actually think it might be a summer of code project to do one function integration where you'd have to have a senior in the community help guide you through, here's where you put the file, here's the build infrastructure, things you need to do, and then you'd have to look at the test results and then dig into it. It, it could be a guided project, actually, yeah, for sure. Um, anything else the community wants to talk about? I have a question for Nathan, but we'll raise it later, I guess. Nathan Sidwell. Uh, I'll bring up the arm both yesterday while I bring up here since uh, uh, Libenbeck. So um, we'd like to well, enable it at least for ARM and R64, well, for R64 targets. Um, and uh, we're working on getting the GCC part so we can auto vectorize stuff and uh, call things out with the right calling convention. And most of the parts are already there. Uh, but we've got some requests of uh, non-GC users who might want to call, uh, who do the, their own auto-vectorization and want to call into a library that has these uh, vector math routines like, you know, vector sign, log, whatever, exp. Uh, so the example given was NumPy, various uh, numerical packages. So they, they want to call their own. They, they know what the symbol is, is. They can figure out what the manually should be, and they just want to call uh, Libenbeck and get, uh, you know, the performance there. So I guess the question is, would the JWT community be, um, uh, accept such a vector math routine implementations uh, without GCC necessarily you know, auto-vectorizing auto them, as long as there's other user-space software that wants to make use of them? So the important thing for libmvec is that you have to design the API and the ABI. And I think that, like, if those are things that you're ready and willing to do, you can post those a API and ABI design and have a discussion driven from that and get to the point where that looks good for, for the AR64 port. So I, I, like maybe Joseph has some input here. I never felt that for libmvec that GCC was the limiting prerequisite, that the prerequisite really was what's the API and ABI design and that the, the bigger conversations around the API and ABI design, and then also like, how does SVE play into this? How does SVE2 play into this? Like, so the, the, just the variance of um, the hardware that's there for AR64 means you have to think quite deeply about the API and the ABI design for those and your calling convention and what that's gonna be for those functions. So the reason why GCC came into the picture is that 
historically Libembeck, uh, the way it declares things is just there is a scalar, let's say, sign in a math header, and we just add some annotation that, oh, we want a vector version of this. And uh, GDPC wanted to make sure that, okay, GCC understands by that annotation the same thing as GLIPC understands. Mm. But if we somehow declare directly the vector symbol and not say that, oh, by the way, this is the sign uh, vector, we, we just say this is the vector, vector sign function symbol, and, and then there is no this dependency that uh, GCC has to understand the same thing as, G, uh, as the annotation in the math header file is doing. Uh, but uh, the question here is, in the future at some point, we might want to use this annotation so that GCC understands that, yes, this is really just the vector sign and I know how to turn the scalar sign into the vector sign mm -hmm. uh, thing. Like, so the, the x86-4 implementation, I believe, grew out of a convenience that much of this API was already defined, right? So there were existing examples of how this was going to work for x86-64, and so it kind of grew out of the existing support that was in the compiler, and then GCC added the header, and we added the annotations. Um, that's just one way to implement this. And I think if you start by having an API and an ABI design, there's no reason why you couldn't go back and then just teach the compiler about that. So, like, again, I think the, the prerequisite is probably not the compiler, but it's given your hardware architecture, how are you going to implement libmvec and its entry points in a way that's optimal for your hardware? So, uh, unless Joseph, you know, unless we think there's a like a GABI issue with libmvec that it should be the same on all targets, but yeah, I don't think so. So if you just define things in the library without having those header declarations, I don't think there are any particular concerns there. It's when you have the header declarations that you get the concerns that arose in the x86 case. Well, there were two main areas of concerns there once you have the declarations the compiler can use. One area is it's very desirable to be testing the header to ensure that the interface used by the functions matches what the compiler thinks the interface is with those declarations. We had this problem with Syncos where it turned out on x86-64 that the header declaration didn't actually match the ABI being provided. And the other is that whatever we put in the header, it does need to have a stable meaning in terms of which instruction set variants are provided rather than a future compiler suddenly interpreting the same declaration as meaning there's an additional variant that's not in old glibc. Now, that may have been more of a concern on x86-64 um, because on x86-64 it seemed a reasonable concern what if AVX 1012 comes up in future. You don't want old headers to be interpreted as suddenly meaning there's that extra version as well. So those are the things to consider when you do put in declarations for auto vectorization. But without the header declarations, I don't think there are any special concerns, though of course you do need to make sure the ABI is what you want it to be. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree completely with Joseph. So then it's, it's really like if you want libmvec, you've, you've got to design that ABI and what, to be what you want. So you've probably got a really good view about that. But, but again, like scalable vector extensions are going to, I think, I think probably the, the one wrench that you're, you're putting in there, and in many ways you are leading the pack in that design because there are other architectures that, are, that want to have these scalable vectors as well. But ARM is leading that charge there. So like... Also, do a good job, because I think everybody else will copy you afterwards. <laughs> um, 
Anything else? Oh, Pedro. Yeah, we'll bring the mic down for you. Hi. So I missed the first couple of minutes. I'm not sure if this came up already. Uh, if you could give us just an update on you know, all these processes you've been coming up with in the past couple of years about patch review and build bot and all that infrastructure work, uh, because we would like to copy the good things you're doing. Uh, um, yes. So I will start with a slide that I've got, status of weekly patch review. Um, a couple of years ago, in the BOF, we came to the community and we said, what do you want? Weekly bug review or weekly patch review? Because if there's a thing that we're not doing, we have to put effort into that, right? The only way we make forward progress on patch, patch backlog is by doing patch review. The only way we make forward progress on bugs is by triaging bugs, looking at them, evaluating them, and closing them. And the community at the time said, we want a patch review process that tries to move forward patch reviews. Um, I am always shocked by going back to these dates and realizing that we've been running weekly patch review with anybody who wants to attend. They're basically like open office hours, uh, Monday 9 a.m. ADT for two years now. Um, and I think the value has been there in that like in many of those Monday meetings, we sit down, we dig through the patch review. Um, some interesting things is when we do that, you identify often new contributors. And you say, oh, this person is new. They're brand new to the community. So we should, we should go and review their patch. So from like being engaging, being inclusive, we can often on that Monday meeting really see there's a new person who submitted something. If the, I mean, our community is not the size of some of the other development communities, right? So if we had way more patches to review, we'd probably have to split it up into multiple meetings or split it up by subsystems or things like that. Like I attended Linux Plumbers Conference in Dublin and the interesting thing I saw, and, and I always still see it in Linux community, is that like the kernel gets split up by subsystems. Like people in one subsystem have almost no idea what someone in another subsystem is doing, right? Like the MM subsystem has a lot of people working on it, and they're very specific. And then driver subsystems are very specific, and file system subsystems are very specific. So you can think of them as like smaller distributed communities, kind of doing this distributed development model. And glibc is a piece of user space, and our patch rate isn't high enough that like a one-week meeting uh, is, it's, it's, it's what we need, right? It's what we needed. Um, and I think in those two years, it's been really nice because there are a set of like people that come with like hardware interests come to the meeting. Some people come where they just want to promote their patch or talk about their patch. Um, and it's been good. Um, so I think there is value that has been invested in that. Now, where I find trouble is holding myself accountable to doing enough patch reviews in a week as a senior reviewer. Like I know, Pedro, you're a reviewer in the GDB community, um, but what I found really valuable about patchwork has been I now have a service level indicator for me where I'm trying to track like how long patches have been sitting in the queue. And I wrote it recently, and when I started, it was at 206 days. And it showed me like how terrible we are because if, if I miss a patch or we miss a patch, like I'm a reviewer of last resort for the community because I'm one of the uh, community stewards, just like I'm Nick Clifton's nodding here in the audience because he's also a reviewer of last resort for binutils. Um, some patches you miss. And the interesting thing is patchwork never forgets. And so when I did the SLI, which is SLI um, is a term called service level indicator. So when you provide a service, when you do something for someone else, there's an indicator. The indicator shows a metric, something, something that you compute that can be like your level of community engagement. Then there's, from the indicator, there's an obligation, which is, what do I want to say to my community? Do I want them to feel like they're engaged? Do I want them to feel like they're getting patch reviews? Like that if you submit a patch, you're at least seeing a review once a month. Do I want this number to drop to 30 from 157 days, right? So, and then 
honestly, today, I don't know how much effort I need to get that number to 30. I haven't actually driven myself to say, like, I want that number to go to 30. How many people need to be involved? How many reviewers do I need? But I'm going to try, right? So what I'm trying to be is objective about the patch review process. So for two years, we've been doing patch review. I think it's been valuable, but I'll, I'll ask an open question. So um, Zabolsh, you come to the Monday meetings. You're looking at things. How do you find the Monday meetings? Do you think they have some value? Do you think we could change them? Well, to me, it's useful because I see what's going on. I don't think it's... Um, it doesn't feel super efficient, but I don't have an idea how to make it more efficient to go through the, all the patches faster or... or, or or better, uh, but yeah, uh, it it every now and then there is an actual issue that uh, it is useful to talk about, and uh, I think those talks would not happen without the dispatch review process when we realize our oh, dispatch actually uncovers some issue and. Yeah, so, so for that reason, it's useful. That's why I'm listening. Yeah, and I, I immensely value the fact that people are attending those patch review meetings and having the, like, the interactive conversation over a patch. Just like we come here once a year only and have that interactive conversation, we've been having weekly interactive conversations where we can hash out really quickly, like, who can review this patch? oh, wait a second, this patch is revealing something really deep about our infrastructure or something that's wrong, and it kind of kicks off ideas, and we're able to quickly, in a meeting, hash out uh, a question. So, um, so, Pedro, you asked about patch review process. So I, I would say there's, there's the, this patch process, which is weekly patch review, and then the other side of it is um, pre-commit CI for glibc. Um, and I can talk about that in a second. but. For, from a patch review process, does, have I updated you on kind of like what it looks like and how it's going? Yep. So, so my question yeah. yeah. If it goes green, it's good. Yeah. Green, hello. Uh, so my question would be, is patchwork proving itself to be the tool you thought you needed or are you still looking for something else? I think the answer is yes, because in the GNU tool chain, we have a highly distributed development model. And in a highly distributed development model where people are kind of all doing their own things, we do still need a place to track the kind of the incoming work, right? Like it really helps me have a way to do this analysis and this evaluation because Patchwork is tracking the list, doing its things, and not only that, we'll see in a bit that like Patchwork also lets you aggregate the CI results and the test results and the job results and things like that. So I use Patchwork as the source of truth. I don't even have to watch the mailing list anymore. Um, and there's a command line client. So in the command line client, I can do git pw series apply. I put the thing into my tree. I kick off local testers. I do a review and I give my reviewed by and tested by, which we'll talk about reviewed by and tested by in a minute. And then if other people give reviewed bias, the interesting thing is if you pull the patch from Patchwork with uh, the Git PW client, Patchwork knows that all these people have reviewed it and it actually aggregates the reviewed by tags so you don't forget to add all the extra reviewed by tags. Um, this is something that like DJ Delore has been after me for a while, which is like, you need to make it easy to thank the reviewers for their review. To grow reviewers, we need to include their thanks in the process. We need to include them marked some way in that process. But there are other tools that do this as well. So before and Padat, which are kind of Linux specific tools, can also be used in this way. But Patchwork has really been useful for me as a maintainer to be able to kind of automate this whole process. So um, Matthew has his hand up first and then Mark. We should just keep that mic on all the time. <laughs> Uh, just uh, one word about uh, maybe one use of the reviewed by tag because this metric I mean if you classify differently the patches that comes from active contributors and reviewers in the community in the in a different bucket from patches which are sent by people who just 
push, throw patches on the wall and see what sticks. I mean, I, th I think it would be important in a, to keep the metric. Uh, so the, the patches that come from people who care about spending their own time to review other people's work, I think should be prioritized compared to the metric where uh, what's the time it takes to review patches from people who do not contribute to the community. Maybe they're, and that could act as an encouragement for people to do re review on their own to gain credit in the community. I, I agree completely. There are I, so- I call that review credit. <laughs> yeah, so it's funny because like Matthew and I have been talking about this a little bit on and off, which is like, what if you had like review credits and like as you review things, your credits go up and as like you submit patches and people review things for you, you like you take a credit back. Um, I don't know what's gonna work, right? And I think that uh, there are probably a variety of service level indicators. Um, it's a friend of mine, Josh Boyer, who works a lot on RHEL, the RHEL side for Red Hat, said to me, because I've been, I've been talking about this, this service level, like how, like, because patch review is, kind, is a service, right? We're providing a service to the community by being patch reviewers. And he said like, well, can you write a service level indicator that's about engagement? And I'm like, man, that's, that's hard to write. That's like, should I be reviewing uh, first time patches first? Should I, be re and should I be tracking that metric? Should I be reviewing patches of people who've reviewed my patches? So people who have a high reviewed by rate Right? Or should I be tracking something else? But I, Matthew, I don't know what the right answer is, but if you have a, a English or French description of, the, of what you think an indicator could be, let's write a Python script and see what the results are for that indicator. Because there are a lot of also like, a, I know NetDev uses patchwork. There's a bunch of kernel communities that are all using patchwork to track patches. And if we can begin to, to like suss out like, what does what is our SLI? How do we compute that SLI? How do we how do we track it? How do we how do we work to engage the new new main new first time contributors? How do we work to engage people who do review patches? Like so, for example, I feel really bad because I'm not reviewing some of it. Hammerval is in Ellis patches, and in Hammerval, if I look at the metrics, has passed me in reviewed buys in the community, which means he's reviewing more patches than I'm reviewing as a reviewer of last resort. But that's great. I love to see people doing more reviews than me. But at Hemerval, being in the lead makes me feel like, oh, I, got, I should be reviewing his patches because he's done so many reviews. So yeah, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, does patchwork also work for um, normal developers? Because that, that, that's what, 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 where I kind of have trouble with it. I love it, but nobody else is really using it. Um, so I'm using it. I, I use it to delegate patches to DJ. I use it to delegate patches. Arjun, who's in the back of the audience there, is on my team, and he's doing glibc reviews. Uh, Arjun, do you look at, because there's a delegate status in Patchwork for the patches that are, that are assigned to you. Do you look at it, I guess? Yeah. Let's ask some real people whether or not they find like as a reviewer, Mark, I think Patchwork does what I needed to do. But as a developer, maybe. Okay, it's it's working. Uh, I guess I'm a bit selfish. I've come to the weekly reviews only when I uh, dropped a patch and I needed someone to. That's okay. Look at it. Don't don't judge yourself. Like. So, <laughs> it's usually after I've come to the meeting that I looked look at Patchwork to see if there's something delegated to me. Um, so maybe I'm not using it enough, I guess. I, I should go and see if there's something, something in my queue right now. Yeah. Um, to answer your question, Mark, we do like, l sometimes look at developer queues to see, 
for a developer, how many patches do they have open? And then we ask developers to clean up their queues sometimes. Yeah. I just wanted to say that I personally find that I, I can find patches easier on Patchwork than in my uh, mail folder, so I use it for that reason, at least. Yeah. Thanks, Sabosh. Uh, David. Some oh, Sadesh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I, I wanted to go back to Pedro's uh, question about how the workflow is for GLPC and uh, the implied question there uh, as to whether it can be uh, useful enough for GDB. And uh, there's another project that's been uh, trying to use Patchwork the way uh, we're using it in GLPC, and that's the GCC project, right? With, with John Wickley trying to uh, uh, do all of the automations that we're doing uh, to, to try and keep the queue in control because really the key thing with patchwork is if you can keep the queue in control the view is really good and 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 then you can rely on it to look for outstanding patches because that's essentially what you're looking for uh and with gcc they found that they just couldn't handle it because uh there is there's a lot of uh community behavior that goes into making sure that the patchwork queue is in control and i think uh, in GLFC, we're kind of in the Goldilocks zone where uh, we have just enough traffic uh, and then we take the extra effort to make sure that uh, the patch uh, uh, the patch backlog is in control. So we have we have repeat calls, uh, we have a script, script that runs regularly. Uh, then a lot of us have gotten to a point where uh, we do not do like last minute tweaks to patches and push them. We, we try and make sure that whatever we have on the list is the thing that we push uh, to Git so that there are matching uh, hashes in, in, in both cases and patchwork then can auto clean up things. So there's a lot of uh, kind of additional effort that goes into making sure that uh, the patchwork view is useful. Uh, so whether it will work for you or not, uh, is something that's going to be very, very subjective. Uh, whether it is currently working for GLPC, it is, uh, because we're putting a lot of additional effort into it. Uh, and uh, would it be better with something like GitLab? Maybe. Uh, but then that's, uh, that's a community-specific question again, because if you want to stick to email-based reviews, uh, then GitLab may or may not work the same way for you so it's 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 a very subjective question and uh it, it's it's not something like you can look at gypsy but then uh it's not something that you can directly pick up from gypsy and say plunk it into uh gdb or vignettes and, and expect it to work that way yeah I, I agree so there are some behaviors that we need to change and like one of the primary behaviors is honor what was posted and commit it or not commit it because we often get i think it's a bad behavior to get a patch and then say oh thanks for that I'll just change it here and change this and change that and then commit it and that's not what the person who was posting maybe wanted to see or wanted to have happen so there is value sometimes in interacting just a little bit with that poster and saying let's get what you have to the point where it's ready to go in and once it's ready, the thing that the last thing that they post is, is good to go. You've given your reviewed by tag, which means that you're done your review, right? The reviewed by tag is that line that you cross saying everything looks good. And then whatever it is that they posted, that's what you commit. That way, both the person who gave you that patch feels comfortable. They say, yeah, like I worked through that whole process. I learned from this process. I got better at it. You gave your reviewed by line. So you get the, you get a little bit of thanks for it. And then what was posted gets committed. So in the past, I think in glibc, we'd gotten into a bad habit of just thanks for the thing. And then we'd modify it and put it in the tree. And that's not great for community engagement, right? Because you want to engage that developer. You want to bring them into your community and work through a little bit of that process. I understand that sometimes there's drive-by contributors, right? And they may say no, but if you engage them and they say no, then you say, okay, no worries, we'll, 
we'll take your patch as is and or we'll, we'll make some modifications and change it. You can, you can suss that out, I think, a little bit. Uh, but there are behaviors like that that I think we need to change, not because they're bad, but because they actually yield automation benefits. Because once the thing that you posted to the list is the same as the thing you commit, you can cross-ref the two. And you can mark something as completed with a commit hash in the database and say, that patch that we were tracking, it's done. The only other way to do that is to use Garrett's concept of change set IDs. Right? And then you have to put change set IDs and things. Now, the kernel community is looking at that, not with change set IDs, but with message IDs. Because the originating patch, as an email, has a message ID. Um, to answer Sadesh's other half of the question, which is like, would it be better to go to GitLab? That's a tough question to answer, because we have a really distributed development model with a lot of FOSS tooling. And there's a lot of benefit to that, right? Because the distributed development model gives developers the freedom to kind of choose their process and their automation and the, and the things like that. Um, but it does make it, does give us a bit of a wall when people come to learn to contribute to the communities through this distributed development model. So, David. Yeah, a, a, couple, of, a couple of points. Firstly, I, I, it occurs to me the review by tag is something I might want to try in GCC. Um, uh, though I'm, I suck at reviewing, I apologize to everyone. Um, and the, but at least um, maybe we should try that in other um, project, sister projects within the tool chain. Um, and the second is, I was saying, are your, are you, show, you were running this SLI Python script, <laughs> and I mean, immediately my, with, I guess this is my procrastinator brain is going, oh, I could hack on the script, I even better visualize it. I was thinking, we could have a histogram showing the sort of the demographics of, are they, you know, where, are there, what does the demographic shape of the, the ages look like? And, well, yeah. that is a kind of, I'd much rather be hacking on the script to see how patch reviews are doing than actually Would you like me to reviews. post the script somewhere well, guess, and then we can you, work you, on it? I, I mean, I'm looking, I, do you, is this a public repository and should it be? It, it is not. So I literally wrote this script in the Toronto Pearson airport while I was on my way to LPC because I was like, I keep saying I'm going to do this. So while I was at the airport stuck for eight hours, I wrote the script. Um, so it's just on my laptop. If my laptop gets taken by airport security, I'm going to lose the script and then I'll have to rewrite it. So I'm going to go commit it somewhere <laughs> so that we don't lose it. <laughs> yeah. And, and then we can share for sure. Uh, yeah, hacking on the virtualization is more fun than that. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, Pedro, the other part of your question was what's going on with pre commit CI? Um, like, I, I bang the drum a lot when we come to this cauldron to say, what can the community do to help me review 100 patches in a day? The obvious answers were no sleep and drugs. And I said no to that. So what, what we settled on was, like, there is a ton of value in pre-commit CI in that, like, we've been running pre-commit CI for 32-bit x86 for, uh, for quite a while now. And you'll, if you're watching the list, you'll see me post things like, this failed CI, like I'll respond to posters. The next step there is really that the bot does it. There are already some kernel bots that do uh, regression testing and post things as patches are making them, their way through the kernel tree and they hit various uh, subsystem maintainers, main branches. There, were, there are bots that test the, the current tree and then report back if regressions happen. So from my perspective, the next step for pre-commit CI is we're going to start reporting the 32-bit i686 fails directly into the mailing list against the patch, the posted patch series that did the thing. Step two for us for pre-commit CI is developer-driven review, which is being able to, as a lead developer or as a hardware vendor developer, for example, for Zabol, for you, I would see this, where you respond to a thread where you think that thread's touching architecture-specific code, and you say, tester, please test on this. And what we want to get to the point is that sometimes some, some specific changes touch generic headers across the board. And to ver validate those generic header things, we often need to run build many glibcs, which, Joseph, thank you for build many glibcs because it is the thing that we use to build all our crosses for all glibc. And so the thing is, like, from a resource perspective, if you burst 
Build many glibcs into the cloud. The average cost for one run of build many glibcs is 20 euros per run in machine resources because of the number of crosses we build and the number of tools we have and the amount of stuff we're building, right? So like, I know that like you have your own home machine, you can run BMG. BMG takes a long time to run because it's got to build all the crosses for all the ABIs that we support across all the target architectures. Wilco's nodding because like he's done it before. Yeah, it's a, it's a long time. If you don't have a fast machine, it takes forever to do those cross builds. But here's the thing, there are, we just, the reason we want this developer-driven pre-commit CI is that sometimes as you're reviewing, you'll see a patch and you'll be like, oh, that touches a gener generic header. What we want to be able to do is hit reply all, have a signed email where you tell the, the builder, build this, build this thing. And then that is going to trigger a runner to take the patch, apply it to your tree and do a BMG run, for example. Um, I want to get to that point because as a reviewer, for me to get to those 100 reviews in the day, I have to be going through those reviews and saying, this one goes to BMG. I want to see a full test run. This one, I, I want to see a, a full test suite bootstrap run, for example. This one, it's going to touch a header that may impact the kernel. I want to see a kernel build after I do the glibc build with the headers, right? So I'm going to, as a reviewer, I want to start setting up some build targets that in the background do very specific things, and it is developer-driven whether or not we trigger the expensive tests on those, on those runs. Yeah. Mark, did you have a question? Oh, right, about the build many glibcs. Oh, you're not, I think it's not enabled, yeah. It, it is, so, um, sorry, let me con continue. Yeah, so, so um, uh, uh, but uh, Joseph does run it. Do, do you run it uh, daily? Yeah, while you get the mic to Joseph, I will say, as a submitter, we shouldn't be asking you those questions. BMG is a very developer-specific thing, and if you're new to the community or you're kind of like just a, uh, like a, you know, it, and you're not a drive-by contributor, Mark. You're, you're deeply involved in the tool chain and, and Valgrind. But at the same time, I recognize that you're trying to just solve a problem that you saw. As reviewers, I should be hitting reply all, and I should be telling my builder to go do the review, go do the build, right? So like any, I want to get to the point where a reviewer that would have asked you to run BMG, they should, ju they should just be hitting reply all and having the BMG run be triggered by that review on their own. And then, then they can come back a couple, you know, they can come back next day having seen the test results and say, yeah, Mark's, Mark's build is fine. It ran through BMG, check Mark. And then they, then they commit the, the change. So Joseph, the question to you was, do you run BMG every day? Okay, so regarding build many glibcs, the- M May I interrupt for a second? Is the mic on? Is it green? Yes. Okay. Regarding build many glibcs, the oh. bots, running on GCC release branches will run every four hours if there are new glibc commits. The one using GCC mainline runs daily. Now, it does still require manual checking of results and investigating the causes. So we have this x86 problem that appeared when I updated the big utils release branch used and no one answered my posting about the cause. My guess is it's something to do with the various protected symbols and so on changes, but I don't know. So there's this unresolved failures showing there on x86 that arose. And there's also on the GCC mainline one, there's this ice on all the 32-bit platforms that arose just before I came here, but I haven't yet investigated what GCC change caused this ice across 32-bit platforms. Now, there was also another unrelated issue I'd like to raise about tracking status of projects across, across well, across, say, GCC or GLibc. So I have this list of features to be implemented for the next revision of the C standard. 
So it's just a rough text file of my own. It's not public anywhere. It's all sorted roughly by when the relevant changes went into the private Git repository for the C standard sources. And so how should we as a community be tracking, say, the features to be implemented for the next revision of the C standard, some of which would need stuff done in GCC, some in GLibC, some in both, some I have notes saying, well, we've got everything required done, but there are these other bits that might be good to add as well and so on. So taking this features for the next revision of the C standard, where we've got maybe 60 features or so to be added across GCC and GLibC, depending on how we count them, how as a community would we learn to track that sort of thing across GCC and GLibC? And of course, if anyone does feel like implementing features from the new C standard, do feel free to go ahead with adding them. Right now, I'm focusing more on the GCC features since GCC stage one will be ending before the freeze for the next few LibC release. But there are lots of features there if someone feels like implementing some features from C2X in GCC or GLibC. So then to just summarize for you, Joseph, if I understood correctly, you have a list of, because you're tracking WG14 upstream for the next C standard, you have a list of things that we need to do as a community for the GNU tool chain to implement the new standard. And then you're saying, well, wouldn't it be nice if we had a way to coordinate and share that list and look at the work items? Is that correct? Yes, and also the coordination sub should ideally somehow be shared between GCC and GLibC, since as far as the C standard changes are concerned, it's a change to the standard which may include both language and library features. Does anybody have any suggestions? Yeah, I would almost say we just want to GNU toolchain wiki that is Git based, and then we start committing into that wiki, and then we can do discuss, you know, patches to the to the restructured text. Maybe we use read the docs, or we just turn it into RST, and then and then we can have a, a repo. I mean, for me, it'd be a Git based repo with all the notes about what we need to implement in RST, and then we can start having conversations about. When, how we implement those things and where we implement them, and then we can have a like a web page. I know some people say uh, it's not a wiki unless you can edit it online, but um, yeah. So do we have a? Do you, um, can we create a like GNU toolchain wiki? I guess that's just Git RST read the docs. We could. I can help with that. Would that work for you, Joseph? If we just had a Git tree, we could commit all your stuff as restructured text and then uh, either use, let's use Sphinx and let's practice using that and output it to a, week, a page and... That's certainly one possibility. I was just raising it as something to be discussed. We would want to be careful. It was suitably clear. This is describing internal to-do list state. We don't want to end up with the situation where people five years from now are referring to this as if this is covered documentation of something, which I have seen, say, I think with some old page on the GCC wiki mm -hmm. about atomics, people reference that as if this is the official documentation for a feature where no, it was some early implementation ideas. So it does need to be suitably clear. This is internal tracking of what we hope to do, it may not be in the official plans, things may end up going differently and so on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Then I think we can probably follow up to make a repo somewhere, read the docs, put restructured text in there, and then we can start tracking that and have discussions about it. Um, we are almost done with four minutes left. Are there any more questions from the community? Arjun, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, this is, um, this is about the re reviewed by stuff. Um, sure. I'm, I'm wondering how the community feels about making it compulsory uh, during a commit to have reviewed by in the, in the commit message 
uh, doesn't have to be validated that it's it's like an actual person or something, but you know it looks for the string. If you're super confident and it's a small change, maybe you say reviewed by nobody. Uh, but it could it could help uh, first of all make sure that we don't forget to add the reviewed by. And I also feel like it adds a bit of like like chain of responsibility on on commits we're making. For sure, I would like to make one. I'd like to make one thing clear. Thank you to all of you who volunteer your time to do upstream patch review and do upstream work. I can't make you do anything. <laughs> as, a, as an open source community, what I have tried to do with reviewed by tags, and we've actually, I've posted this before, we've had kind of an exponential rise in reviewed by tags. And that's been driven by like an organic this is a good idea, this is a good technical solution, this solves the problems that we have. Making things compulsory is, like, is, is, a, is a hard thing, but as a community we can agree if we want to say our best standard, is, our, our best practices to put reviewed by tags. We can ask for things of people, and the thing that's probably missing today from the from the glibc processes, I've never written up a doc about like how to be a good reviewer. And this is something that like, you know, Arjun, you and I have talked about before, like um, the, I really need to probably sit down and just write a doc like how to be a good reviewer in the, in the GNU tool chain. I don't know if there are other docs we can pull together for this. I don't know if there's one for GDB, Pedro, or Nick for one for being a good reviewer. But like in that good reviewer doc, I think we can organically say to the community, look, reviewed by tags, help the maybe even new contributor know when's this process done, right? Like, has this person said, yeah, you're done? Like, that line, that reviewed by line is really the very clear demarcation point where the reviewer has said, I've finished my review, and what you have is good enough to go into the repo at this point. So that is enormous value to a new contributor, to someone who doesn't maybe know you, doesn't know that you're done doing your, your reviews. So. I think that we, rather than, I guess, say you have to put a review by, we write a doc saying how to be a good reviewer, and in that doc we are including, you know, you should, you should be using reviewed by tags. Because cause then I'm going to write automation, and when I write the automation, Matthew, it's going to be every time you give a reviewed by, you're going to get a plus one, and then that's going to trigger me to go review one of your patches. <laughs> But, but also, we have a lot of good reviewers. I, I was just looking at numbers, you know, yeah. I want to make the sales pitch. We had 750 commits approximately in 236. Yeah. And 450 reviewed buys. Like, oh. that's more than, that's, that's. So that's we, get, we hit, you're saying we hit about 50% of them were mm -hmm. reviewed by. Also, uh, almost 60, uh, you know, authors uh, and 20 reviewers. So it's, I'm not saying everyone's doing it, but m many people are, a lot of people are. Yeah. So, it won't con inconvenience a lot. I would strongly encourage reviewed by tags because of the like, the like that clear line and the value they bring as a reviewer to be like you're done and then and then move on. So, am am I incorrect that when you do a release, you include the list of committers or authors in the news event announcement? Yes, but, but you I don't include the reviewers. One hundred percent, and so like. I developed that process to, to auto-generate the list of people who committed, and you're not wrong. That's a great idea, a good suggestion that I, I should add an extra step that says, and the following people reviewed patches, and thank you very much for your review. And I can't do that unless I have an easy way to automate the process of who reviewed what. So I am going to take that note, Pedro, to add into the release process that I just run a, a git log command to look at who reviewed what and then post-process that into the release message. You are correct. We do currently post-process the git commits to give thanks to everybody who committed, and we should be giving thanks to everyone who reviewed. I'll do that right now. I'll add it to my notes. Um, we are, we're, we're done. Uh, yeah, it's uh, coffee break time. But thank you very much for coming to the BOF and asking questions. Oh. Oh, does it switch? Oh, it switches talks, not coffee break yet. Yeah, it's the risk of BOF. Yep. And there's Palmer. Thank you. Thank you.